you're listening to the Down East Mike Podcast, the quirky little podcast from Maine. And now, your host, Down East Mike. Dee 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 all. Good morning, everybody. This is Down East Mike, your genial, happy, happy go lucky, somewhat stunned host of the Down East Mike Podcast, coming to you live. From way down east Maine, if you're here on vacation, you lucky person. You're in the midst of like seven days of rain that's coming up. We did have a sunny day yesterday. Uh, Yeah, this is a Down East Mike episode number 94 of News and Commentary for Saturday, June 24th, 2023. Our motto, if you're new to the podcast, is some of this is whimsy, some of this is true. And the interpretation of it all is entirely up to you. This podcast is a, if you're new to it, it's a, definitely a slower pace. I mean, if, if we got any slower, we'd be standing still. This is not really frenetic. Well, sometimes the coffee kicks in and it gets a little more pumped up. But most of the time, it is it is one long, drawn-out podcast we're taken to task quite often for thin content and uh, or or you know just a lackadaisical performance but that's fine anytime you don't like down east mike on the podcast just let us know we'll bring frank norwood in and, and then things will get grumpy and depressing so if we want to keep things upbeat we have down east mike host it in today's episode we have will the rain in maine Never end. 1977, June. It was just raining every day. Just like today. Eastport built boat. Head south for Jaws 2. 1977. Isn't that something? We had a little story about that boat. An electric light revealed the fellow. That's a story from 1898. In this day in June. 1898. A West Coast flower takeover from the 1950-ish. That's when it took over. We have the illness of the instant birthdays and much more. We will go to the international headlines right away. If you're just getting up, things are really interesting over there in Russia. It's a real mess. That uh, Wagner guy, uh, Pergnozan, whatever his name, Pregnozan, he's in a standoff with the Russian army and he's doing like a coup. And Putin did a recorded telecast and he said, we're going to put it down, but... What's interesting is that the Wagner boss has taken over a whole southern city of a million people, including a military base, and Putin's nowhere to be seen. So we don't know how that's going to shake out, but maybe by the time you're listening to this, things are going to be even more interesting. That's the number one headline in the world. Uh, What else is going on? The Supreme Court reinstates Biden's immigration policy. That's so muddy that I couldn't get my head around that one if I tried. Florida drag show law was blocked by the federal judge. You never have enough drag shows. Florida teen survives an alligator attack by punching it. It's really easy to get rid of an alligator if you punch it. I don't think so, actually. A trans New Hampshire Democrat was arrested and he distributed child pornography. An e-bike batteries burn again after New York City Chinatown blaze kills four. Those e-bike batteries are really dangerous. They're always blowing up, catching fire. Uh, Speaker Kevin McCarthy House and the House GOP want to expunge Donald Trump's two impeachments. Coast Guard admits the explosion heard when the Titanic sub lost contact. And toy maker recalls 7 million baby shark children's toys due to a risk of impalement. That's almost ironic, isn't it? A baby shark toy risking impairment. The local main headlines, cannabis tourism is booming at the Laughing Grass Campground in Maine. Did you know cannabis tourism was a thing? I didn't. A new mini golf course is set to become a central main destination. You can never have enough mini golf courses. I think a soft ice cream is the ice cream they always serve at a mini golf course. A 911 operator 
and helped nine-year-old save dad's life and was honored by the Maine State Police. They do a great job. Um, anything else happening? The Maine DEP suspends two Nordic Aqua Farms licenses for the Belfast land-based fish farm. That's a bit of a mess up there if you've ever seen their plan on where they want to have that fish farm. It's like right along a stream and it, it has a big piece of the waterfront that they want to develop that fish farm on. Uh, a lot of planning needed. House flipping is on the rise in Maine again. They're making money by buying houses and painting them and putting new carpet in and new roofs and selling them at a markup. So that's, that's kind of a boom again. All right, so that's that's all our headline stuff. Let's take a look at our at our news and, and the podcast. Oh, we did have an illness of the instant: the pool cleaner's claw. Now, pool cleaner's claw, that is primarily a masculine illness, uh, and that develops. Uh, it is it probably a, a right hand. Uh, issue, but pool cleaner's claw is from gripping the uh, pool cleaning dip net for too many hours in any one given uh, period, and your hand will become clenched in a uh, claw-like fashion. So pool cleaner's claw is treated with with heat and, and ice. It's that rice thing. It's rest, ice, circulation and elevation that's how you treat pool cleaners claw best avoided by not getting involved in pool cleaning whatsoever but if you are in that situation you do just treat it with the rice method happy birthdays today to Yusef of Westbrook he turns 33 Yusef is a dad to five he works at the local pet pharmacy. Happy birthday, Yusef. Happy birthday to Maribel of Scarborough. She's 65 today. Maribel is the director of a kayak excursion firm, and she has planned many a successful outing. Happy birthday to Maribel. Our word of the day is extirpate, and you'll see where that ties in a little bit later in the podcast. Extirpate is a transitive verb It means to destroy completely or wipe out or to pull up by the root or to cut out by surgery. Extirpation, extirpator is the person that does it. Uh, Digging out the history of extirpate, you don't have to dig too deep into the history of extirpate to discover that its roots uh, are in roots or stumps. And extirpate grew out of a combining a Latin prefix E-X, meaning out, and the Latin noun stirps, meaning trunk or root. I have like stirps, I think. Among the earliest definitions of extirpate in English were to uproot and to clear of stumps as well as a broader meaning of to destroy completely or wipe out. And they note here, while today we often encounter extirpate in relation to plant and animal species, that have been regrettably removed from a specific region or in total. Intangible, such as evil or prejudice, for example, may also be extirpated. We hope this helps, but if you find yourself stumped the next time you encounter extirpate, just remember we're rooting for you. This is from Merriam-Webster. I wish that I'd read that copy before I read it to you, but whatever. Uh, This day, 1977, no added license required for a moped. There's a bill in the house in Augusta to allow any licensed main driver to operate a moped in the state. That was unanimously passed in the Senate. And you got to be crazy to be out on that highway on a moped. A moped is a bicycle with a small motor able to achieve speeds of up to 30 miles per hour, traveling more than 150 miles on a gallon of gas. Without the measure, a special motorcycle driver's license would be required to operate mopeds. Uh, The bill would establish a $5 registration fee compared with a $10 fee for motorcycles. 
it would require that moped drivers observe the same safety rules as bicyclists riding in single file on the right side of the road. They would be barred from interstate highways. Supporters said the bill would encourage the use of mopeds as an energy efficient form of transportation. We see a lot of those electric bikes around today like that. Uh, On this day, 1977 as well, a story about the awful weather that Maine was having at the time. In the subject line, the rain is less than you think, it's just the gloom. The weather hasn't been as bad this month as most of us think, at least not according to the precipitation statistics the crop reports and tourism reports. It just hasn't been good for haying, getting the suntan on the weekend, playing golf, or working in a backyard garden. A spokesman for the National Weather Service in Portland, where the state's forecasts are made, said Tuesday that the amount of rainfall so far in June doesn't break any records. In fact, it's about what's expected for June. Now, I can tell you today that... I would never have expected this much rain as we had. Anyway, back to the story. The number of days on which it has rained is another story in the Bangor area. On only seven of the last 21 days, there wasn't measurable rainfall. It's hard to remember those seven days. In Caribou, Maine, it was even worse. There were only four days without measurable rainfall and only one day without any precipitation. In Portland had only three, the Weather Service officials said. Normally, some measurable rainfall is expected every three days. All the dreary weather has proved somewhat discouraging for the backyard gardeners. The biggest problem has been germination. Germination. Since the bright, hot sun has been largely missing from the sky since Memorial Day, the ground is very cold. It hasn't been conductive for many seeds, particularly vine crops like cucumbers and squash, to take that first step on the way to becoming plants. Some seeds have even rotted. A little bit more on that. Let's see. The cool, damp, damp weather is also an ideal environment for some kinds of plant diseases like blight on potato, tomato, and pepper plants. There was some good news. Cabbage and strawberries seem to like the rain, but this guy is noting that the strawberries would need some warm days in the next weeks to keep mold off the fruit. I need some some warm days to keep the mold off me, I think. There have been three consecutive rainy weeks. We could go on and on about it. But basically, uh, the National Weather Service in Portland has a 30-day forecast for mid-June to mid-July, which predicts near-normal temperatures and precipitation that would exceed the median amount. The forecast doesn't say when it will come. So, quite interesting, 1977, the weather is just about what it is today. Looking at that Jaws boat story out of Eastport, a boat constructed at the Passamaquoddy Yacht Company in Quaddy Village by Captain George Harris, for Universal Studios' production of Jaws 2, left here Tuesday morning from Martha's Vineyard, a shooting site for the film. Does anybody remember Jaws 2? Everybody remembers Jaws 1. Accompanied by his son, George Jr., and a grandson, Eugene Newcomb, Harris left Eastport about 9.30 a.m. for Augusta. There, it was planned that he would be met by his nephew, who was expected to haul the craft on the last leg of its journey. I like this guy. You know, he didn't want to go any further south than Augusta. A man after my own heart. The Eastport boat builder was commissioned by Universal in May to build a 24-foot fiberglass boat with a lobster boat style hull and superstructure for the sequel to Jaws. Uh, in late May, Joseph Elvis, Joseph Elvis, a properties engineer and designer connected with the film company, flew from Martha's Vineyard to Eastport. If he really wanted to absorb the culture, he should have driven there, not flown. Just to appreciate that, how far away he's got to go. To anyway, he flew from Martha's Vineyard to Eastport to, to discuss construction details and requirements with Captain Harris. 
You see him in the living room with a notebook. The craft known as the East Port of 24 is one of the longest made by the Harris Boat Yard, which usually produces boats ranging from 18 to 24 feet. And they have a line of smaller craft as well as canoes. They misspelled canoes. It's pretty cute here. C-O-N-O-E-S. Because Jaws, the mechanical shark, eats the end off the East Port of 24, causing it to sink, parts of the boat are simulated. For example, the engine box is empty, the craft is outfitted with a keel, and the sides and floor of the boat are much thinner than normal and will eventually be fitted with trap releases and tanks to make sure the craft sinks on cue. So they designed the boat to sink when they needed it to. A large number of Harris boats are sold to private owners in the Cape Cod area, and it was at Martha's Vineyard that one of Harris's boats caught the eye of a Universal Film executive. Oh, that's a pretty boat. That boat, which has since been purchased by the film company, will be used in 90% of the shooting with the Quaddy Village boat used as a backup boat for the final scenes of the shark. Both boats are expected to be transported from Martha's Vineyard to Florida, the major shooting site for the film. Harris boats are owned all over the U.S. from Alaska to Florida and in the Virgin Islands and Bermuda. His 52-foot quality dam, licensed for 35 passengers, is often seen in the Passamaquoddy Bay with fishing and sightseeing parties. Well, that's a nice story. Well, we had some recipes here. This is a good one. Orange sherbet salad. Do they even make sherbet anymore? One large package of orange flavored gelatin, six ounce package. One cup of boiling water, one cup of orange juice, one pint or two cups of orange sherbet. Go get yourself some. One can of mandarin oranges. All right, gelatin, boiling water, orange juice, two cups of orange sherbet, mandarin oranges. You drain the mandarin oranges. You got good sugary water. Why would you drain it? Okay, an 11 ounce can of mandarin oranges with pineapple tidbits may be used in place of the mandarin oranges. Man, this is getting confusing. In a small mixing bowl, dissolve the gelatin in the boiling water. Okay, I can do that. Add orange juice and sherbet. Blend until sherbet's melted and the mixture is smooth. Chill until thickened but not set. About 45 minutes. Who wants to wait that long to eat something? Fold in oranges. Pour into oiled one quart mold or eight inch square pan. Chill until firm about one and a half hours to serve unmold or cut into squares. Lemon or pineapple sherbet may be used in place of orange. My goodness, what a recipe. Here's a really bad recipe. Fish scallop. Two pounds of fish. That sounds appealing, doesn't it? Two pounds of fish cut in serving size pieces. Whatever that means. One and a half cups of coarse cracker crumbs. Two cups of milk. Three tablespoons of butter, one and a half tablespoons grated orange, half a teaspoon of salt, quarter teaspoon of pepper, and then then another half a cup of butter to crumbs. Arrange the fish in serving size pieces in layers in a greased casserole with crumbs. In a saucepan, this is a real highbrow recipe. In a saucepan. Combine milk, butter, onion, salt, and pepper. Heat to scalding and pour over contents of the casserole. Top with buttered crumbs. Two tablespoons of grated Parmesan cheese may be sprinkled over the crumbs and a sprinkle of paprika for color added. Bake in a hot oven 425 for 20 minutes or until browned and the fish is done. And then they add... If you're not totally turned off, use the sandwich filling in regular sandwich bread or use the thin pocket-like rounds of Lebanese Syrian bread cut in two. That's just awful. 
I have another one, a 40 Love Punch. Two envelopes or half a cup of lemon flavor. This is from 1977. Half cup lemon flavored iced tea mix with sugar or in two envelopes. One quart of cold water. You see that plastic Tupperware container full of cold water? One can of frozen lemonade concentrate thawed. One can of frozen orange juice concentrate thawed. Two cups cranberry juice con cocktail. Today, I think it all says GMO on the side of it. Oh, this is the good stuff. One bottle, 28 ounces of ginger ale, chilled. In a large thermal jug, combine lemon-flavored iced tea mix, water, lemonade, and orange juice concentrates. Stir until tea and concentrates are dissolved. Stir... I'm starting to laugh here. Stir in cranberry juice and ginger ale. Add ice. Makes about 12 8 ounce servings. This punch is good for any event where a punch is needed. They have a footnote. A new look to an old favorite is salmon loaf with a frosting of mashed potato. You'll only need a salad and green peas to make the menu. If there is to be dessert, a rhubarb pie is suggested. I think these recipes will turn me off from food for the day. No more. Okay, uh, 1976 on this day, Viking 1 was taking pictures on Mars. One of two television cameras aboard the Viking 1 orbiter took a picture of an island in a channel complex on Mars. The picture covering an area about 775 square miles was taken on June 22nd during the first photo reconnaissance of the prime landing site for Viking. The tail of the island may have been shaped by flowing water in Mars' geologic past. The crater rim material also has been etched by erosion. In the pictures, just of course, it looks like a grainy picture of a mountainside. It could be any anywhere. Uh, this day in 1898, we had some headlines. Cod and Pollock fishing in the bay continues to attract numbers of boatmen and a large fleet of small boats are anchored near Cochrane's Ledge, which marks the boundary line. Heron have been scarce in the neighboring weirs during the week and little work has been done in the sardine factories about the island. We hate it when the sardine factories are idle. East Port, Maine will have a big celebration of July 4th and races will be held at McFowl Park during the afternoon. An excursion will arrive from St. George, New Brunswick uh, up the Magu, can't read that one, uh, Magawantic River, accompanied by the brass band from this quaint Canadian town and the usual large crowd is looked for during the day when all the neighboring island towns show up. A long list of land and water sports has been arranged, but that would have been a great thing to go back in time and witness that up in Eastport, Maine. Uh, the first steam yacht of the season arrived in Passamaquoddy Bay. It was the I Tuna. And the captain was Corkum, Captain Corkum out of Boston. The iTuna was owned by A.S. Bigelow, who with his wife and daughter were on board, and they're on an extended cruise along the Nova Scotia and Newfoundland coast. I bet it was nothing but fog. Deputy Sheriff P.A. Martin made a seizure of beer and liquor this week at one of the houses at the fort, and the liquor was evidently being kept for the flag raising to be held there soon. Captain Norton's four-masted schooner is loaded with ice at the Knickerbocker Ice House in Pittston, Maine this week. Captain and Mrs. Norton are calling on friends in town, so somebody else is loading the ice while he's out visiting. Owing to the heavy rain, the Children's Day exercises were only held Sunday morning. So imagine that. In this day in 1898, it was raining as well. Out of uh, Portland, Maine, here's one of our headline stories. So fascinating. A young man was discovered by Mrs. Mrs. Captain A.J. Kennedy. The young man was attempting to enter her house in Portland, Maine on Wednesday night. 
Mrs. Kennedy was awakened by a noise at about 10.30 p.m. and went downstairs to investigate. An electric light revealed the fellow. An alarm was given at once, but no one could be found. So even in 1898, electric lights were deterring crime. Uh, Papa Murch has never forgotten the song that the boys sang during the early days of the Augusta encampment that How Cold I Am, How Cold I Am song. He stopped in front of the journal's tent this morning, mopped his brow and said, they aren't singing for stoves down here, but I expect they'll be getting up a song about ice chests next. Pop stands, the heat tip top is looking prime and is just as popular as he was on the muster field at Augusta. Now they were getting ready for the Spanish-American War here. Green-eyed jealousy was rampant in the heart of one home-hungry boy in the 2nd Battalion last night. He had a letter from his mother in Portland telling him how she had been cooking good things for the Connecticut boys who are summering at Fort Preble. Nice, isn't it, he asked, looking up from his letter to the hunk of beef which had been served out with his rations. Makes us fellows feel real cheerful to hear about the feeds they're pushing out to them chaps up there. Lovely, I don't think. There they're up to Portland eating strawberries and cream and feasted on cake and pies that our folks are making for them. And here we are down here eating army rations and thanking the Lord we've got a commissary who knows enough to get all there is going. But for them fellows to get pie and cake and glory while we're sweating our hides out down here where there ain't no one to check the thermometer in everlasting trying for a record about eating all the good things that is in the pantry. It's gold darn hard lines to have your folks write how they're laying themselves out to feed a gang of dress paraders. Why in thunder don't they send the stuff down here where we can't get a bit of home cooking to save our gizzards. We'd know what to do with it if they did. Would we? Well, you bet your neck. I'm going to write mother. Uh, it goes on and on. That was basically a rant that the, they were cooking for the locals, but not for him. Let's see. We have another story here. Oh, there was a lot of hands getting burned. Mrs. George Bucknam of Lisbon. She was frying donuts fainted and plunged her hand into the fat and she burned it seriously. That was one. And then Mrs. Kate True out of Minot, Minot, she burned her hand severely on Saturday with hot lard. It gets better. Reverend T.F. Jones' feet and hands were badly burned while trying to save some books from burning at the fire in his home in Orono on Tuesday. Now, do you think he was trying to save the books or he was actually trying to burn them? Auburn and Lewiston Shoe Factory shipped 5,860 cases of shoes for the week ending Wednesday and received in 150,000 pounds of leather. What a productive, productive area. News out of Bar Harbor. Assistant Engineer Robinson sent here by Major Hoxie to construct fortifications and mount the big guns at Turtle Island in Egg Rock began operations Monday with a large crew of men. And the lighthouse boat Myrtle was in the harbor Tuesday having on board the cable which is soon to be laid from Baker's Island to Northeast Harbor a part of the signal services. Again, a time of great industriousness in the nation and in Maine. Well, let's look at our flower today, our main flower of the moment, a lupin, which is a controversial plant. In the years past, there was a species of lupin that was native to Maine, the lupinus perennis, but it's now so scarce that it's nearly extirpated, extirpated from the state of Maine. As you're driving the highways and byways in Maine in the spring, you'll almost always see a beautiful carpet of pink and purple picturesque flowers. This plant is not native to Maine. It is big leaf lupin, Lupinus polyphyllus, which originated in western 
United States. And this plant was introduced to Maine as a landscaping plant in the 1950s. It quickly got out of control. It is an invasive species. It's an invasive plant that can crowd the native species out of their preferred habitats. Also, their seeds are toxic to animals if too many are consumed, and that threatens both grazing farm animals and native herbivores. And just an aside, but right around mile marker 42 in the Bowden, Bodenham area uh, this week, we did see an albino deer feeding in the lupins there. Had, it actually had some brown spots on it, but just a little fella, but uh, that white deer standing out in the field of lupins early in the morning. This does not mean that the big leaf lupin is always harmful. However, it's a good source of nectar for pollinating insects and has been known to attract hummingbirds. The plant also provides regulating ecosystem services as it has deep roots that help prevent erosion as well as supporting services as it is a legume and thus fixes nitrogen and returns it to the soil. Uh, the National Park Service, talking about Acadia National Park, it prioritizes protecting native species and works to eliminate non-native invasive species. Currently, the National Park Service removes big leaf lupins when it encroaches on natural habitat. Isn't that something? Um, the larva of the monarch butterfly depends on milkweed at it, as its host plant and it cannot eat lupin. So the lupin does have an impact on the monarch butterfly because it crowds out the, the milkweed. They note here, anyone outside of the park is free to grow the non-native species. Big leaf lupin in its native range the Pacific Northwest is an integral part of some Western ecosystems, but we should not assume that big leaf lupin in Maine is harmless. I am scared of it now myself. Uh, did you know that lupins can actually signal to a bee that the pollen rewards are gone or almost gone? It's true. After pollination occurs, the petals change color as a way of saying no more here try the next flower which redirects the bee to a flower that needs pollination wow that's tremendous that almost wraps up our podcast for today we will look at the weather before we send you out the door to greet the day so for today saturday june 24th 2023 a chance of showers then showers likely and possibly a thunderstorm after 2 p.m some of the storms could produce heavy rain Patchy fog before 7 a.m., they're noting. New rainfall about a tenth to a quarter of an inch, but who's measuring these days? Showers tonight. For Sunday, a chance of showers before 2 p.m., then a chance of showers and thunderstorms between 2 p.m. and 3 p.m., and then showers likely and possibly a thunderstorm. Could they just say it's going to be wet? Highs around 81, so uh, hot and muggy. Uh, looking at the forecast out through the week, Monday through Friday, you've got like an 80 to 90% chance precipitation every day. I wish I could bring you some more good news on that forecast, but it is what it is. Well, that's it for our podcast today. Hope it wasn't too thin for you, but, uh, you know, we'll have some more content down the road. It, it, it keeps on going and going. And until next time... This is Down East Mike, wishing you and your loved ones a day that is full of grace, love, and kindness. We'll see you. Everybody's
getting seasick. Everybody gets seasick. Everybody gets seasick now. Seasick. Sick. 